You are listening to episode 59 of Paz de Chipotle. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook, and author. And on this podcast, I explore the gastronomic traditions of Mexico and bring together the voices of cooks, authors, and entrepreneurs who build cross-cultural bridges around the world, championing Mexican food. To find more information about my podcasts, books, to subscribe to my newsletter and contact me on social media, go to pasdechipotle.com. Many are the agricultural experts of Mexico that have traveled far and wide around the world, and many of them ended up at the center of many social, cultural, economic, and culinary tales. Think of the rule of tomatoes in Italian cuisine the large-scale corn production in England that prompted the construction of corn exchanges around the country, and how beans became a quintessential part of many African cuisines, and what to say of Chile's role in shaping the very gastronomic identity of South Asia. Well, today we continue with the second installment of the series Cultural Staples, and it is the turn of a plant whose remote origins are found deep in the humid tropical rainforest of Central America. And while this plant had a humble beginning, it indeed was destined to become the world's most desired commodity of all time. Yes! I am talking about cocoa, and such is the cultural value of cocoa that it is not surprised that its history is equally rich and complex. In fact, I decided to explore this product not in one but two episodes. So today, I will tell you about its origins, botanical aspects, and how important it was for ancient indigenous cultures and its transition into the Spanish colonial period. Behind this episode, as usual, there is a whole lot of research, which is complemented with some excerpts from my ebook Mexican Chocolate. There is, of course, an accompanying reading list with fantastic books to help you continue exploring more on this subject, and you can find them in a special blog post available on my website, pasdechipotle.com. And I have also added plenty of visual references to the YouTube version. So, as you can see, I made sure that you can fully enjoy Coco's history at its glorious best. So grab some Coco and get comfy and ready for this adventure. I hope you enjoy this episode. In the property market, as well as in food history, there is one thing that matters the most, and that is location, location, location. (laughs) We know that the place of origin of a plant really defines the flavor of the foods and drinks that are prepared with it. It all comes down to the soil, temperature, height, minerals, and even plants that grow in the surrounding areas. We call this terroir. And if a glass of wine can take you to the sunny slopes of Tuscany's hills or the idyllic south of France, where will a bite of chocolate transport you? Well, thanks to modern archaeobotanical studies, We know that the oldest specimens of cocoa seem to have come from the northern region of South America, that is, the cooler part of the Amazon. And we don't know exactly when or how this plant disseminated to other areas, but whether the seeds were carried by migrating birds, mammals, or taken by nomadic tribes during their long journeys, we can confidently say that cocoa traveled north. So it went from Central America to modern-day Mexico almost 4,000 years ago, where its domestication took place. 
The area where cocoa naturally thrives is located right by the equator, which is an imaginary line that divides the Earth in half, separating the northern from the southern hemispheres. Now, imagine a flat world map and draw a very thick line covering the upper and lower parts of the equator. So it touches the Tropic of Cancer in the north and the Tropic of Capricorn in the south. You might notice that across the continents, this area has very similar and distinctive weather conditions, mainly due to the amount of sunlight it receives, which creates a warm and stable temperature with vibrant tropical and subtropical ecosystems. This is by far the most fertile and biodiverse area of the planet. Now, some of you might remember that in previous episodes of the show, going a couple of seasons back, I have talked about the so-called coffee belt. And if you remember the description I gave about it, you will realize that I'm actually talking precisely about the same region, which also receives the name of cocoa belt, because today cocoa is cultivated around the world in this area. I'm sure you are all familiar with chocolate bars, choco chips, cocoa nibs, and powdered cocoa. But can you describe the plant where cocoa actually comes from? Let me help you with that. The prodigious cocoa tree, with its pompous scientific name of Theobroma cacao, or food of the gods, as assigned by the Swedish botanist Carl Linnaeus in 1753, is a plant that shares a very unique characteristic with other similar tropical trees, like papaya, jabuticaba, and jack tree. They all grow their fruits from the trunk and not from the branches. The roots of this tree grow in two directions. The upper surface of the roots extend sideways to provide stability, while the ones at the center grow deep down to secure the extraction of nutrients from the soil. The trunk is somehow thin and can grow between 3 and 7 meters tall. Cocoa flowers grow from the trunk and bloom protected from the heavy rains by a thick leafy canopy that grows from the branches above them. During the lifespan of a cocoa tree, it can produce up to <laughs> 6,000 flowers that, if pollinated, they will produce the same amount of fruits that will grow into large pots. And because of the stable tropical weather where cocoa trees live, they can yield several crops a year and can even simultaneously grow pots with varying states of ripeness. Cocoa pods resemble the shape and kind of the size of a small American football with a characteristic elongated ellipsoidal shape of between 20 and 30 centimeters long. The skin changes color as the fruit grows and develops a hard and leathery appearance and texture with a rind of about 2 to 3 centimeters thick. It is a very strong and heavy fruit that can weigh between 450 grams to 600 grams. The color of the pods can go from deep red to mustardy yellow, brown and green. And there are three main varieties of cocoa that are cultivated around the world. These are Forastero, which is the most common, Criollo and Trinitario. When a ripe cocoa pod is harvested and sliced in half, you can actually see vertical rows of seeds that are the size of a broad bean covered with a white, sweet and delicate pulp that resembles the texture of damp cotton. A single cocoa pod can contain up to 50 seeds. And if you think that to produce 450 grams of cocoa, you will need about 400 beans. That means you will have to harvest and open around 8 
cocoa pods. At a cacao plantation, a single person can manually separate around 2,000 beans from their pods in one single working day. That is roughly 40 cocoa pods, of which 5 kilos of cocoa will be obtained. Later on, I will tell you more about the way in which the seeds are prepared in order to produce cocoa. But for now, I will just slip in the fact that it is botanically incorrect to call the seeds beans because they are not a legume. And it is very likely that Europeans call them beans because they share a similar shape. So if you hear me referring to them simply as seeds, you know what I'm talking about. Perhaps many of you have heard, read, or even seen on TV shows and documentaries that experts talk about the importance of cocoa for indigenous civilizations, such as the Aztec or Maya. But the truth is that there were many other tribes for whom this plant was important, and they gave it a special place and function in their society. But finding about the cultural and botanical history has been a very slow process, in which tiny pieces of information have allowed us to understand and study the presence of cocoa in the ancient world. The most important sources of information about the life and history of the ancient cultures of Mesoamerica are hidden well in plain sight, in the stone-carved inscriptions and painted stories on the walls of ancient citadels and temples. Another source are the sacred ritualistic objects and, of course, the very famous documents known as codices which are the equivalent of ancient scrolls or books. Codices varied in size and aspect. Some were made out of animal skin, such as deer. Others had pages that were made out of barks of trees, like a book. And many were made out of a single woven sheet of cotton cloth, on which imperial scribes documented, well, many aspects of the history and life of specific places. Today, there are only about a dozen or so surviving pre-Columbian codices. The vast majority of them were destroyed by burning them or other means during the aggressive cultural purges of the colonial period. And most of the codices that were preserved are now part of European collections and archives. Among the surviving codices, only a handful of them contain specific information about cocoa, and each of them provides us key information about the context and relevance of this plant for each culture. For instance, some codices include references about botanical aspects of the plant. Others give us context of the rituals in which cocoa was drunk. Some explain how cocoa was linked to the sacred pantheon of gods, and a few describe how cocoa was used to pay tributes and also used in transactions. Through many books and academic papers, I have found five codices with direct references to cocoa. Three of them are from the Mexica or Aztec culture, and two are of Mayan origin. First, the Tudela, Florentine and Egervari Mayer codices are Mexica, and they are located in Madrid, Spain, Florence in Italy, and Liverpool in England. The remaining two are the Madrid and Dresden codices, both of Mayan origin, and one of them lives in Spain and the other in Germany. Now, of course, you might be wondering how these codices survived the purge, and the reason is that many religious scholars actually defied the law to preserve, translate, and even create new ones, working side by side with indigenous scribes. Some of these men were Bernardino de Sahagún, Torquemada, Motolinía, and Mendieta, among many others who tried to preserve as much as possible of the history and culture of the rapidly fading indigenous world. Now, something you might not know about codices, if you've never ever seen one, 
and I will make sure to include visual references in the YouTube version, is that the writing system used to create them is entirely different from the Latin alphabet. The ancient cultures of Mexico developed intricate systems of glyphs which represent letters or sounds, and pictograms that represented words and groups of words. Using a combination of both, the scribes were able to document historical events, describe religious ceremonies, and many, many other aspects of everyday life. So, it is thanks to the combination of codices with archaeological objects and archaeobotany data, frescoes and engravings at temples and citadels, that we know that the first culture to cultivate and consume cocoa was the Olmec tribe, which also constitutes the earliest civilization of ancient Mexico, which is why we call it the Mother Culture. The Olmec occupied part of the modern-day states of Veracruz, Tabasco and Chiapas, which are part of the coastline of the Gulf of Mexico. We also know that they were the first tribe to have created the earliest recipes to prepare drinks using the roasted and ground seeds of cocoa. And according to the findings of anthropologist Sophie Dobshansky Co., the Olmec people were also the first to give a name to cocoa-based drinks sometime around a thousand years before Christ, and they called it cacaoa. We know that they also created special ceremonial pottery to preserve and drink cocoa. Even more intriguing is the presence of powdered cocoa, whole cocoa beans and residues of cocoa drinks at special burials and areas where human sacrifices were performed, which tells us that they were also the first to attribute supernatural or mystical qualities to cocoa. During the decline of the Olmec world, another tribe rose to power, one that will inherit most of the knowledge and traditions of the mother culture. And of course, Coco was part of this inheritance, and they were the Mayans, who also wrote in phonetic glyphs, and they created a specific symbol for cacao, which they called cacao. The Maya extended a bit further south towards Central America, where the cultivation of cocoa became a fundamental part of their agriculture, gastronomy and economy. And they were just very enthusiastic about consuming cocoa in different ways, mainly because of its distinctive and potent effects in the human body. We know now that cocoa seeds contain large quantities of a chemical compound called theobromine, that when consumed, it stimulates the central nervous system, lowering the blood pressure and relaxing the muscles. It is also a diuretic, meaning it will make you pee. It also stimulates parts of the brain that can lead to feelings of arousal and it triggers the release of dopamine, which is the so-called happiness hormone. So basically, cocoa operates like a drug. It makes you feel happier, relaxed and aroused. And you can see why in the modern advertising industry, when chocolate is targeted to adults, it is invariably associated with sensuality. In the Maya creation myths, cocoa was elevated to the status of a life-given substance. According to their beliefs, the gods created mankind out of precious ingredients like corn, sweet things, and cocoa. This belief meant that for the Maya worldview, the cocoa tree was a connection with the divine, and consuming the seeds, well, actually brought them closer to a different level of existence. This explains why the ceremonial drink cacao 
was pretty much a symbolic representation of blood, and it is not surprising that the Mayans saw very fitting dyeing this drink with a paste of the crushed achiote seeds, which has a distinctive crimson red color and a slightly tangy and acidic flavor, resulting in a luscious and strong flavored blood-like drink. Archaeological findings show that Mayans, like the Olmec, used cocoa beans to create mortuary offers and ornaments. Maybe it was a way for them to provide the souls of the departed with the energy and protection they needed for their journey to the beyond. Just as the Olmec passed on traditions to the Maya, a much younger tribe known as the Mexica that flourished in central Mexico also absorbed much of their culture, including, of course, our old dear friend, Coco. And we know this thanks to our trusty sources of information, like the Tudela and Florentine codices, that tells us how the Mexica or Aztec rose to power and expanded their control over other kingdoms and rapidly adopted the fashion of drinking Coco at their own imperial courts. And while coca wasn't farmed in the cooler high plains of central Mexico, they sourced it on a regular basis through their vast commercial networks. The Aztec also created their own narratives to feed coca into their culture. And one of such myths was that coca beans were gifted to them by Quetzalcoatl, one of their main gods. And these served as the basis to give Coco a luxurious and divine connotation, which helps explain why Coco became a luxury commodity. At the great pre-Columbian markets, the exchange of man-made products, such as weapons, clothes, and tools, along with gathered fruits, vegetables, and hunted animals, were the basis for the development of primitive economic systems. Each item was assigned a value, and based on supply and demand, the price of each item was negotiated, until those bartering agreed to a fair exchange. For centuries, this basic system of bartering prevailed without much change. In many other parts of the world, if you think of it, this problem was solved by the development of currency. Coins were created from precious metals, and that made a more flexible economy where goods and services could be bought and sold. However, such a system did not develop in Mesoamerica. So the indigenous cultures found a solution in the development of a proto-currency. And this was cocoa beans. The high appreciation for this luxurious commodity led to the use of raw beans as a regulated proto-coin with an established market value. Larger transactions were made with items like gold dust stuffed in feather quills, coral beads, jade, and other precious stones. While economic historians define money or currency as an item that can be exchanged with an agreed symbolic value and which can be accumulated, cocoa beans in ancient Mexico were somewhat more complex. Indeed, cocoa beans possessed the characteristics of a currency, but they were also edible, and if a person was affluent enough, his family could afford the luxury of literally eating or drinking money. Thanks to the Florentine Codex, we know that a pochteca, or courier, in the Aztec Empire could earn as much as a hundred cocoa beans a day. This might sound like a lot of money, but if he needed to make his shopping at the market, he would need 200 beans for a turkey, between 10 and 30 beans for a rabbit, 3 beans for a turkey's egg, 
three more beans for a ripe avocado and one bean per piece of sapote fruit. <laughs> Life was expensive then as it is now. Other historical records from Central America, compiled by the Mercedarian friar Francisco de Bobadilla, indicate that in Nicaragua, for example, a cocoa-producing territory, the relative value of cocoa beans was comparatively different to that in central Mexico, where cocoa had to be imported. For instance, while rabbits were sold for 10 cocoa beans apiece, a slave's worth was established around 100 cocoa pots. Given this situation, it is no surprise that the transition from a bartering economy to a European mercantilist system following the colonial invasion was not an easy one. After the arrival of Spanish conquistadors and the downfall of the Aztec Empire in 1521, the viceregal government in New Spain, today's Mexico, was faced with the task of creating economic institutions from scratch a Herculean task in and of itself, made more difficult as they were also required to set up mines to extract gold and ship it back to Europe, which was one of the main reasons of the whole setup of the colony. As a result, currency in the colonial period was always in short supply, and this affected the daily transactions of the colonial population, the viceregal government responded to successive economic crises by creating currency tokens made with hard leather, wood and different metal alloys in order to sustain their economy. Such solutions had really a limited success and the Spanish were forced to look to the indigenous economy for a solution. And actually, they reintroduced the use of cocoa as money in the late 16th century. In fact, while Europe was undergoing rapid social and technological change, Mexico was still using cocoa as a payment method for laborers in rural states or haciendas until the early 19th century, even when currency was available. This was effectively a form of social control that reinforced class boundaries, punished the rural poor and tied them in a form of servitude. And this came to an end thanks to the War of Independence, which culminated in 1821. We will return with the show after this short break. Coco has inspired the most extraordinary recipes around the world but its remote and fascinating origins date back to ancient times in the New World, where it was seen as a sacred ingredient and a gift from the gods. Cocoa and chocolate's association to refinement, indulgence and decadence still resonates today. Many of us still regard it as a blissful mouthful of joy, luxury and pleasure. My ebook Mexican Chocolate, Stories and Recipes of Mexico's Greatest Gift to the World, will take you to discover the fascinating origins of the world's most desired food and will inspire you to celebrate Coco's delicious culinary possibilities. Go to pasachipotle.com forward slash publications to find more about my ebook Mexican Chocolate. Go to pasachipotle.com forward slash publications. Now, let's find out how do we go from harvesting a cocoa pod to drinking chocolate and the different culinary and medicinal uses that cocoa had in the pre-Columbian world. Whether you like your chocolate, bitter, sweet, milky, liquid, cold, baked in cakes, toasted or powdered, it all begins with a harvest of ripe cocoa pods. So once the pod is open and the pulp-covered seeds are removed, the rim and pods 
are discarded. The oldest and most popular method to process the beans consists in placing them on elevated beds or containers and cover them to encourage the natural fermentation of the pulp. After several days of fermentation, the pulp is drained, and while large processing plants will consider this fermented pulp as waste, many cacao-producing communities use it to prepare alcoholic drinks. Once the fermented liquids are drained, the beans are shuffled and lay out to dry in the sun, constantly turning them for several days to prevent the formation of mold. After this, the beans are ready to be transported in jute sacks that allow them to breathe. And just like coffee, this is the ideal stage to transport the beans from one continent to another without spoiling them. The next stage is roasting, which can be done at home using a clay griddle to gently toast the beans until the skin becomes hard and brittle and the bean develops a dark and shiny brown color that glistens with the distinctive oil and smell of the butter that is released during the roasting process. The skin or shell is peeled off and can also be used to prepare drinks, infusions and some modern day uses include the elaboration of pharmaceutical and cosmetic products. In the Mexican states of Oaxaca, Tabasco, and Chiapas, it is common to find chocolate mills, where you can purchase whole raw beans and have them roasted right there, and you can even get costume-made pastes and choose from a range of ingredients like almonds, sugar, and cinnamon to obtain a rich, oily, and hot paste that you can take home and use straight away to prepare drinks and other sweet and savory foods. Us Mexicans are very familiar with the earthy, dark and bitter taste of cocoa because pretty much everyone is brought up drinking homemade hot chocolate that is prepared with water or milk using solid tablets. But we also use well-known commercial brands. If you bite through one of these hard tablets, you will feel a very grainy, bitter, sweet and dark chocolate. No wonder why many people, myself included, don't find the taste of creamy and sweet dairy chocolate too appealing. I, for one, find it way too sweet and waxy. Since ancient times, the traditional method of grinding cocoa beans at home is a very straightforward process that requires of a metate grinding stone, which is made out of a single piece of carved volcanic rock, and a special metlapil, which is a thin and elongated stone that is held with both hands on either end to gently but firmly grind the beans against the metate stone in a continuous back and forth motion. To ease the process, a hot piece of coal is placed underneath the metate, which warms up the stone and encourages the oils in the beans to loosen and melt. So, how about now we see how ancient cultures liked their cocoa? Thanks to the combined information from the Madrid and Dresden codices, along with many surviving ceremonial cylindrical vases, we know that Mayan rulers created sumptuary laws to control the consumption of cocoa among the commoners. In other words, by law they made it very expensive for poor people to be able to afford it. Drinking cacao, for them, was always a special event, and the preparation followed very specific ceremonial steps. For instance, cacao was decanted repeatedly to form a foam, and this was performed by beautiful ladies who were very likely royal concubines. There were many ways in which the Maya prepared drinks using cocoa. Some even used the fresh pulp, or the recipes used the fermented pulp, and of course, many of them included the toasted and ground beans. Some ways to prepare a red blood-like cocoa drink included the use of a chiote paste, which I mentioned earlier, but also toasted and ground chiles, 
and toasted and ground seeds of mamey and sapote fruit, corn masa dough, vanilla, and old spice. And it was likely to be sweetened with honey or corn cane sap. Now, this certainly shows the Mayans' curiosity and willingness to explore the culinary possibilities of cocoa. As I told you earlier, the Mexica culture adopted many of the Mayan ways of preparing and using cocoa, but they adapted the recipes to their particular taste. And most notably, they ditched the use of achiote. We don't know exactly why, but maybe they found it too strong. Instead, they used many different toasted and ground chiles. The special name for a drink prepared with cocoa received the Nahuatl name of chocolatl, which combines the Nahuatl word for water and the verb that refers to froth or mix, chocolatl. But this was not the only preparation that used the paste of toasted and ground cocoa beans, because it was also used as a cooking ingredient to prepare hot and nutritious drinks that were thickened with corn masa, called atole. And my favorite, they used to make nutritious snacks in the shape of bowls with this cocoa paste, corn masa, seeds, and these were part of the rations of warriors during battles. Now, enjoying gastronomic sensory experiences was as important then as it is now, and the care and attention put into preparing and presenting chocolatl was very important, because it seems that when it came to the foam of this drink, bigger was always better, which gave way to the invention of a steering tool called molinillo, and special jars, pots and cups. In fact, drinking chocolatl as a family or community was part of important rites of passage, such as births, weddings, or funerals. Curiously, to this very day, in many villages of Oaxaca and Chiapas, it is customary for indigenous communities that during the formal courtship of a couple, the family of the bride will do several visits to the family of the groom And every time they will bring large baskets with bread and chocolate to represent a symbolic dowry. The bride will then prepare chocolate with a present. And then drinking it all together represents the union of the two families. Now, let me share with you some curious and surprising medicinal uses of cocoa. I found very endearing that cocoa was used to disguise the horrific taste of certain plant-based medicines. Anthropological and archaeological studies have found that ancient cultures administered cocoa to treat all kinds of common afflictions like agitation. It was an effective remedy to treat chest problems, treat liver diseases, intestinal infections and respiratory problems, and was even used to treat fever. Cocoa ointments were also popular to treat burns, and expectant mothers will be given the fresh pulp of cocoa seeds to ease childbirth. The leaves of the cocoa tree were used to prepare infusions to clean external wounds, as they have antiseptic properties. And the solid oil or butter of cocoa was employed as a skin moisturizer and to prepare ancient cosmetics. In fact, Fray Bernardino de Sahagún registered almost 300 different medicinal uses of cocoa in the Florentine Codex. And now we get to the crucial colonial period in which the conquerors succumbed to chocolate. Columbus's very questionable abilities as a sailor, explorer and businessman brought him to the Americas not only once, but he even managed to find the way back and did the same journey several times. For his fourth voyage, he brought with him silver, gold and other commodities, including cocoa beans. 
but honestly, it is no surprise that he wasn't able to get any attention for these precious seeds. And Chocolate's big European debut was put on hold until the cutthroat conquistador that was Hernán Cortés did a much better job at selling it. Part of Cortés's job was to send detailed reports to the Spanish crown about the process of the conquest and establishment of the colony. And he did so diligently, but often took enormous literary liberties to exaggerate his victories and edit out his defeats. But every now and then, he actually included important details about his experiences and findings. In one of such letters, or Cartas de Relación, written in 1519, he details his thoughts about the prodigious chocolate drink, about which he says, The divine drink builds up resistance and fights fatigue. A cup of this precious drink permits a man to walk for a whole day without any food. <laughs> well, for an army on a mission, that surely was a big discovery, an unideal power drink. So upon his return to Spain, he took with him cocoa beans in 1528 and slowly but surely became popularized. But it wouldn't be until 1544 when Dominican friars bought cocoa beans along with several captured indigenous people and introduced them along with chocolate to the court of Emperor Charles V. Now, I won't go any further talking about the European adventures of Coco, because you will find about all that in the next installment of this Coco special. What I will tell you now is how chocolate shook the spiritual world and moral views of Spaniards. How? Well, I told you that the brutal and systematic destruction of indigenous cities and the building of Spanish urban centers occurred almost simultaneously during the first 70 years or so of the colonial period that started in 1521. And even after the many outbreaks of smallpox and other diseases that were introduced from the old world that killed around 3.5 million indigenous people, their presence still constituted around 44% of the total population of New Spain. The fact that Spanish invaders depended largely on indigenous people to learn about traditional agriculture, botany, medicine and geography, learning their food traditions was also crucial because they were not familiar with most of the foods and plants available here. However, Spaniards didn't come empty-handed. In fact, they introduced large numbers of crops, farming animals and agricultural practices of their own. So sugar, dairy products, spices and meats made their way into the colonial cuisine. Combinations that once might have seemed outrageous or exotic became, well, a useful metaphor for the unavoidable cultural integration that was happening at the time. The particular case of chocolate is a very good example of this. Chocolate was already a well-established gastronomic institution among the ruling classes of Mesoamerica, so it rapidly became the drink of choice of the colonial elites. As I mentioned previously, chocolate and cacao were richly spiced and were served as cold drinks prepared with a base of water. But in the colonial period, these drinks were subject of major culinary transformations. The most radical changes was that the Spaniards preferred it hot and started replacing water for cow's milk. Admittedly, one cannot deny that this transformed chocolate into a creamy and rich drink that was further enhanced by the addition of sugar, which replaced honey. Another change was that a natto or a chiote and chiles were left out and instead the exotic flavor of cinnamon was used to infuse chocolate. Chocolate became such a popular drink that captured the imagination and palates of nuns, friars and monks of every order to the point of inspiring extensive philosophical and medical debates. And to illustrate this, let me read you about the curious case of a prominent historian of Spanish heritage by the name of Leon Pinelo, who in 1693 wrote a book called Whether Chocolate Breaks Ecclesiastical Fast? A Moral Question 
which is probably the first book entirely dedicated to debate the ethical and philosophical considerations of drinking chocolate. One of the conclusions of this book is that chocolate is a drink appropriate to all kinds of stomachs, so long as it is not drunk in excess. Now, Pinello kind of contradicts himself because he really exalted its many virtues and found chocolate to have enormous restorative powers, and he also said that it stimulated nocturnal works, whatever that means. And further on, he highlights the benefits of drinking it regularly, encouraging people to drink a cup in the morning, another cup between 9 and 10, and another one after eating, and a last cup between 4 and 5. <laughs> no, that's moderation, right? Now, religion itself was integral to laying the foundations of the colonial society that would mirror that of Spain, which is why the authorities and institutions in the New World were obsessed with it. They scrutinized the simplest of actions of everyday life through a puritanical religious filter, and many clergymen and religious women considered that drinking chocolate could put the salvation of their souls at peril. But why? Well, it seems that chocolate drinking presented a fundamental contradiction for religious groups who lived under strict principles of poverty, frugality and sacrifice, and who fundamentally opposed the indulgence of those bodily pleasures, like the enjoyment of a decadent chocolate treat. I mean, let's give them that. So this meant that while very few had a strong position against chocolate, most of the religious class were forced to work very, very hard to justify its consumption because they pretty much became addicted. For instance, nuns from the nunnery of Our Lady of the Angels in Mexico City went so far as substituting entire meals with chocolate in order to fit it into their diets. And their daily rations even included a large cup of chocolate with pastries for dinner. In contrast, other orders made their novices take an oath in which they specifically saw to never ever drink chocolate or incite others to do it. The debate around chocolate reached such heights that even the then Pope Innocent IX received a document in 1591 by the famous physician Juan de Cárdenas, saying that drinking chocolate absolutely breaks the rules of fasting, as it perfectly substitutes any solid meal. Hence, it should be totally prohibited in such occasions of penitence. The city of Puebla, my hometown, had a particularly large population of cloistered nuns, friars and monks, and their right to drink chocolate was fiercely defended by many. An example of this is the nunnery of Santa Rosa that took the necessary precautions to obtain signed orders from its founder to ensure that the religious community should always have the economic means, equipment and even money to pay maids to exclusively prepare chocolate. Now, to close this episode, let's make some final reflections of all the things that are mentioned today of the history of cocoa. First, in spite of what the marketing industry tells us about authentic Belgian or Swiss chocolate, you now know that cocoa, in fact, is a plant that is native to the Americas, whose botanical origins can be traced to the area between Central America and the south of Mexico, sandwiched between the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer. I told you today how colonial trade was responsible for the dissemination of cocoa, which, like coffee, was successfully introduced worldwide around the so-called cocoa belt, tracing the equator around the globe. You also learned a lot about codices, which are our most precious sources of information, from where we have learned many aspects about the life of the indigenous world before the Spanish conquest. I told you that frescoes, engravings and objects also contain valuable information about the many symbolisms that cocoa was given in different cultures. 
and we saw that preparing cocoa beverages was one of the many ways to use this prodigious plant, and that not only beans but also the leaves were used to prepare medicines and remedies. We discovered that tracing the history of cocoa shows us how foods, traditions and practices can be adopted from one culture to another, and each one of them will attach different meanings, adapt them to their taste and preferences, and will give them a special place in their social practices. And finally, I explained how Coco sent shockwaves through the Spanish colonial population as they debated themselves over fighting the urge to surrender to the dangerous enjoyment of Coco that awakened their gluttony and sensuality, or to restrain themselves and fight the sinful temptation. And we certainly know who was the absolute winner of this battle. Coco has indeed a fascinating and vast history, one that we had just begun exploring. So keep your eyes and ears open for all that's ahead. Thank you for listening to this episode of Paz de Chipotle that was written and produced by me, Rocío Carvajal. I have put loads of images in the YouTube version of this episode to illustrate many of the things that I've mentioned today. Now, if you want to receive some backstage gossip, news and information about the projects that I'm currently working on, well, you can simply subscribe to my newsletter, which is free, it comes with a welcome gift and has absolutely zero spam. You can just go to my website, pasdechipotle.com. And while you wait for the second installment of this Coco special, spread the word, share this pod and have some chalk. <laughs> well, that's it from me for today, my friends. Until the next time.